well. Um, we obviously um, want to maintain um, further constitutional battles like Scotland and Northern Ireland and so on um, to stay with us because that is a, the future of a progressive UK which potentially has uh, much more ability to work closely with EU neighbours um, and to go um, forward with a Europe which is committed to women's rights, which is committed to a modern way of working and which allows opportunities for women. And I would just finish with this, that when I'm talking about the cultural change, um, when I look around at many of my colleagues in Parliament who spent time training in the European Parliament, um, they've made such an impact on our work here in the UK. And I'll just take two examples. One is Mary Cray, who was an intern in um, Strasbourg and, and Brussels back um, in the 1990s, and the impact she's had on our environmental work. She's now working for Living Streets, but she also did an enormous amount while she chaired the Environmental Audit Committee, ensuring that the EU legislation on clean water, clean air was integrated into the way that we look at the environment now. And there's a real push for um, the crime of ecocide to be seen as the fifth pillar of the International Criminal Court. Pillars one to four all deal with human rights, but the fifth one, ecocide, is the definition is being hammered out at the moment by Philippe Sands and some of the other international jurists. But I see that as our next step um, and very much women being in the leadership role around promoting being kind to the planet. Um, and the other person who I think we have to remember on this day as well is the wonderful Joe Cox, who was a great speaker, who had a real heart for the Middle East um, and who was so committed to um, working together for equality. And tragically, she was taken from us um, by a far right individual. And at the moment, we have a big battle on our hands to keep that seat in her memory. I was up last weekend talking to folk and trying to explain the reason why there are 1.3 million more children in poverty is the Tory party and their inability to um, deal with inequality. It's only the labour movement across Europe, the labour movement internationally, as we've seen with President Biden, who will focus on stimulus for low-income families, who will focus on the environment and putting right some of those big decisions now so that we can enjoy a good environment in the future and working together to promote the role of women, the right that we have to be equal and for um, our family rights, and also to have equality in the workplace, wherever that may be. Thank you. Thank, thank you uh, ever so much uh, for that, Catherine, uh, and for reminding us about some truly uh, inspirational Labour women, um, and also for mentioning the Batchley and Spen by-election, which allows me to give a plug for the Labour Movement for Europe's phone bank uh, for the Batley and Spen election, which is at half past five this evening. Um, so I'm sure we can get some details about that um, in the chat um, if you'd like to uh, join us to make sure that we get uh, Kim Ledbetter um, elected um, in a week or so's time. So uh, next I would like to move over to uh, Glenys Wilmot um, to talk to us again for about seven minutes. Over to you Glenys. Thanks very much Alex. Uh, it is a horrible week this week and a reminder of some of the things that we are losing out of and ho I'm hoping that at some point people will realise the mistake they made uh, and will get back into the EU in the future. But what has the EU done for women? Where to start? Because there's so much, isn't there? Well, before I was elected as an MEP, I was uh, a political officer and a senior organiser for the GMB. And uh, during those long Tory years under Thatcher, it was a dark time for trade unions. It, for those of you who remember, for trade unions and their members, we were constantly under attack. There was a continuous er erosion of trade union rights. And the only light at the end of the tunnel at that time was legislation from the EU. But there had been a huge antipathy on the part, particularly on the part of the left, towards the EU, and in some cases still is. And the mantra of many was that the EU was just there to, to promote the interests of big business. And it wasn't until we had the change narrative with Jacques Delors and we had that agenda on social Europe that trade unions started to see that by working together across the EU, they could actually influence the outcome of legislation that would actually improve workers' rights for their members. This was 
a huge counter to the constant onslaught that they've been facing over the years. And of real importance was legislation that improved the lives of many, many women across the EU, including the, e the UK. We had EU legislation has been mentioned on equal pay, equal pay for work of equal value. And although Thatcher's government was forced to change the law, many women have still had enormous battles over the years to gain equal pay for work of equal value in many workplaces, including public services and the retail sector. The Pregnant Workers Directive gave pregnant women more health and safety protections in the workplace. They gave them protections against discrimination and protection against dismissal due to pe pregnancy and rights to maternity leave. The Part-Time Workers Directive gave women for the first time some rights pro rata as their full-time colleagues, rights such as paid holidays, rights such as sick pay, rights on pensions. Now, to us, it seems obvious that they should have had those rights in the first place, but of course they didn't. It was disgraceful, really, the way that part-time workers were treated. And of course, we come to the Working Time Directive. When I first became an MEP, this was one of the first uh, issues that was being dealt with. I was on the Employment Committee at the time. And, you know, this gave workers so many rights, right to four weeks paid holidays, rights to rest, rest breaks, legislation on night working. You would think there would have already been that, but there wasn't. And of course, the right to work no more than 48 hours averaged over a 17 week period. Now, the 48 hour week gave us huge conflict with our own government. We were in government then. And we had massive conflict with the Labour government. There was huge pressure on Labour MEPs not to support this legislation. It caused conflict within the EPLP, it caused conflict within our groups, and Labour ministers were lobbying Tory MEPs in order for them to support their stance against this, the, the Working Time Directive. We just couldn't understand it, it was horrendous. And of course, some of my EPLP colleagues succumbed to the pressure, not all. Many of us actually supported the legislation despite the pressure we were put under. But, you know, it did cause many disagreements within our own, uh, our own group. It was a horrible, horrible time. We had similar problems with the Working Time Directive, which at the time affected mostly women. It was mostly women that were affected by agency work. And, you know, we had ministers, Labour ministers again, coming to lobbyists uh, to vote against the legislation. And I had a conversation with one who I won't mention by name, but didn't understand the problems that this gave many people and was telling me that people actually enjoyed the flexibility of only having to work two days a week or eight days a month or whatever it was because they could all earn a thousand pounds a day. So they only needed to do that and didn't understand that for most people, this was about security at work. They needed security of work in order to pay their rent, put food on the table. And it was very frustrating to try and get that message across to our own ministers. It was heartbreaking really. I've just mentioned uh, a few bits of the legislation that impacted particularly on women. It's something that we're going to miss out on unless we do something about it. The EU has had such a positive impact for women on, in the workplace. But, you know, we've got to continue to forge those links. We've got to continue to make sure that our voice is heard. We have to continue to campaign for women across the EU, because I can't see this government doing it, no matter how uh, Boris Johnson likes to pretend he's so keen to help the red wall seats and working people. It's a load of nonsense. We know it's a load of nonsense. So we have to make sure we forge links with our sister parties across Europe. We have to forge those strong links within the socialist group in the European Parliament. That's very, very important. We have to ensure that our voice is heard and that we continue to work to improve the rights for women 
into the future. And let's hope it's not too long before we're back where we belong within the EU. Thanks very much. Thank you ever so much um, for um, those remarks, Glenys. Uh, so next up, uh, that leads us neatly into uh, talking, hearing from uh, Kudsia Batul, um, who is Head and Equ of Equality and Strategy um, at the TUC. So over to you, please. Thanks, Alex. Um, you know, it was really moving listening to that and listening to the, um, the impact that um, the EU has had on the world of women and the world of women at work and you know nobody feels it more keenly than our members you know I come here as a um a member of the TUC and, and you know we represent 5.5 million working people across the UK the majority of whom are women because there are lots of women in the workforce and I was just minded by what um, Glenis was saying about Boris Johnson's aspirations and I don't know if you recall but recently at the G7 summit um, as a rather weak um, comparison to the really strong stimulus that Joe Biden is doing in America, Boris Johnson said he would like to, uh, you know, build back um, femininely. And, you know, and, you know, and certainly from our perspective, that does not mean putting women and women's rights at the heart of building back. But it seems to be about um, accepting less and doing less for women. And I want to talk a little bit about what the current context is for women in Britain today, because I think it's really important. Now you might not know, so excuse me for reminding you all that we're in the midst of a global pandemic. And um, that has had quite a significant impact on women. I use the analogy all the time and my son thinks it's bonkers, he's six. I always use the analogy of toothpaste because I think the pandemic is has been like um, this pressure being put on a toothpaste tube and all the toothpaste has frozen out and it's all about inequalities and we can't get that back in now and we've really got to deal with the mess that we're left with um, and you know all those rights that um, Glenn has talked about that women have and that were afforded to us by Europe are at risk and they're really important to us in addressing those inequalities so uh, you know please forgive me because it is going to get dark because it is dark you know the um and, and I'll be clear with you, the pandemic has had an unequal impact on people. And the people that have borne the brunt of the pandemic have been working class people. And of those working class people, guess who's borne the brunt even more? And it's been women, you know? And, and the reason is, and it's not because it's affected dis people disproportionately, it's become, because it's shone a really stark light on the deep and persistent structural inequalities which cut across our country. They've been disproportionately affected in health, in social and economic crises that have come from the pandemic. Uh, they women have been expected to meet rising care needs. They um, um, women have been at increased risk of domestic abuse. They face restrictions to accessing sexual health, family planning services, and we know from our data that women have been more likely to be affected by job losses at a time of economic instability. Um, and, I, and it's really important that I say that, the, that yes, obviously for women it's dire, but for women who have got other aspects to, our, to their identities, so uh, black women, disabled women, LGBT women, and working class women, the situations where some intersectional aspects of it is really important. And it's highlighted things like um, the economic segregation that women face particularly those in vital frontline jobs in sectors, including social care, retail, travel. And the other thing I will mention is that the majority of key workers, the majority of people that have kept this country running through the pandemic have been women. However, uh, discrimination in those services has meant that many female key workers have been disproportionately exposed to a high risk um, of COVID and denied access to PPE. And that's not even talking about, you know, if I had three hours I could do about the experiences of pregnant women and the um, what's happened to maternity and healthcare services during the pandemic. And that's before we get onto some of the decisions that this government has made regarding women and that have impacted women. And one of the main ones has been around childcare. And you know, the government rightfully, and, you know, we wouldn't disagree with the government's decision to close schools and the need to really shut down services to stop the virus from spreading. However, I can 
bet my bottom dollar that there was no equality impact uh, assessment done and nobody thought to think about what the impact of those decisions would be on women, what they would be on women with caring responsibilities and what they would be on women with caring responsibilities and jobs, because the expectation was, as it always is, that women will pick up the burden, that women will pick up the slack because that's what we do. And um, what it meant was that working parents became full-time carers. You know, we know there's an unequal division of unpaid labor in households, and it meant that women were providing two thirds more childcare a day than dads were, and where social care services were closed and millions were asked to shield at home, it was women that were left to fill the unpaid care gap in that sense as well. And for many, many women, the impacts have been pay job loss and pay cuts. And what I would say is that, you know, we've got to work really hard, not only to address the inequality that the pandemic has highlighted, but to make sure those rights that Glenis absolutely rightly um, highlighted are protected from attack, are um, really reorganised against any desire to attack those equal pay for equal work, right for women that are pregnant, rights for women that are disabled, rights against protections from sexual harassment, rights for part-time workers, because who make up the majority of part-time work it's women rights to pension because we know that women at the other end of the working spectrum are treated incredibly poorly and we've got to make sure that women are cared for well into the years when they can't work anymore um i could i could talk for three hours alex would you like to carry on uh, but what i will do and say you know from our perspective We've got to work with our partners in Europe. We've got to work with other organizations and we've got to find that solidarity so that together we can stand against those attacks that are going to come. I mean, we already know that the government took a hatchet to the working time directive. It was leaked and uh, they backtracked and said, no, 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 we weren't doing that, but we know what they're up to. And we've got to really think cleverly and really th think strategically and stand together. Brilliant. Uh, thank, thank you ever so much for that. I mean, one, one thing is clear that our trade union partners can absolutely continue um, to work with trade unions um, right across the EU. Uh, one thing when I, when I was an MEP um, in the petitions committee, for example, we had a huge petition uh, brought by the Mux strikers with the help of the Bakers Union. But what was so clear was that all the other trade unions across Europe uh, were coming along with their people signing their petitions as well. And what you find is that, that these big Big multinational companies is that they try out different poor employment practices in different countries, see if they can get away with it and export it to another country. So if we're going to be fighting global capitalism, we need a bit of socialist solidarity. So um, now it is going to be over to you. So if you could start quickening up your blue hands virtually for me so we can get some questions or you could try waving at me in a more traditional way if you can't find your blue hand. So, and I'll try and take them in threes. Um, we've got Monica, got anybody else? Come on, it's always difficult to do the first questions, but then you'll all want to do them at the end. So let's try and get some more. Let me see some blue hands. Okay, we will make a start um, with Monica then. Let me see if I can get you to unmute. Can you unmute for me, please? There we are, yeah, yeah good. Fantastic. Oh, well, thank you, it's lovely to be the first, why not? <laughs> um, it's a subject really dear to my heart and it makes me think suddenly, who do we have in the UK at some official level, maybe local, maybe, you know, regional, devolved assembly level, or maybe government level that actually is an official spokesperson on women's affairs or on women's equality or on gender equality. I can't think of anybody. And yet we used to have many organizations, including rather sort of conservative and, and cautious one called, I seem to remember called the, the um, National Commission of Women. So 
this is my concern because there seems to be nobody that speaks for us. Uh, you know, the Fawcett Society is all we have. And the last I knew they didn't even have a leader. They only had an interim leader who, who couldn't take up any issues. I, I was in contact with her. So I'm afraid that as you rightly say, you know, many, many uh, very fav much favorable legislation will be eroded without a squeak from any official level. Great, thank you, Monica. And I can see also in the chat, um, we've had a question um, about Erasmus um, and making sure that um, young British students uh, don't lose opportunities to study in other European countries and equally the other way around. Um, and we've also had a question about how we can work um, closely um, with the cooperative movement um, right across uh, Britain and the European Union. So, uh, Catherine, would you like to uh, take a stab at those questions first? And everyone else, please, please start thinking of more questions uh, for the next round. So over to you, Catherine. So in answer to um, the first question about representation, in terms of the Labour front bench, obviously we're shadow, we're not in government, but Marsha de Cordova is a good um, European uh, MP and she represents a part of London which has a very high number of EU nationals. She's been working closely with our team to try and promote the EU settlement scheme. You'd all be aware that it's coming to an end, the window in which people have to apply um, in the next week. And the government has now said that if there's a good reason for a delay, that they will accept that. So we're hoping that this will stop what was a nasty um, attempt to put EU nationals down uh, last month when the government decided to hold in detention, immigration detention, some EU um, individuals who were traveling to the UK to take up work. Um, and there was an outcry at that. And we're watching that very closely. I wrote to Kevin Foster about that, who was the immigration minister. And, um, you know, I can sh send you the reply. It's a very standard reply, but, you know, we have to be very careful in the UK about the message that we send and the culture um, and I think that goes very much for women who want to take up roles in the UK who have settled status but are now quite worried about what they will meet when they do border control. Similarly for students, um, I've done um, some work before the London elections with students who are very worried about what the future holds for their degrees in um, UK universities. And I feel it's an important um, move for us to maintain the importance of collaboration. Sadly, the government has also moved to cut down the funding for certain research projects so that postgraduates um, also may struggle in terms of some of the global health and other initiatives where we have hundreds of EU um, PhD students working closely and um, we are monitoring the numbers who apply to UK universities. In terms of e uh, UK students studying in the EU, um, because of COVID that has also dropped, um, but that is something which we need to call for more vociferously to ensure that those um, relationships are maintained. We still have a parlous um, language teaching to most of our secondary school students. Um, and I'm in the all party group for modern languages to promote um, language learning um, and to promote a curiosity about studying abroad. Um, and this government has been um, culturally appalling in terms of encouraging the cross Europe conversation to be maintained. Um, and, you know, anything that colleagues feel on this call, we can raise in the way of parliamentary questions. Please put them in the chat box and we'll put them in. But there's a lot that hangs in the balance, not just for our own university sector, but for a lot of women who um, obviously do PhDs or do basic degrees. Erasmus being the basic degree, but also Horizon and other projects um, are at risk. And a lot of our regional universities are at risk as well. Um, and this is disastrous for that important network of regional universities, which is, you know, obviously meant to be the emphasis of this government on the regions, but we're seeing um, that that's not the case. I'll let others pick up some of the other questions. Kutsia. 
Thank you. And um, we have just now been joined um, by uh, Seema Malhotra. Um, so I'm going to break into this, this round of questions um, so Seema um, can make um, her introductory remarks um, to you as well. Um, but keep, keep thinking of questions and I can see that hands um, are going up um, and then we'll go back um, to this first round of questions. Um, so it's my great pleasure uh, to introduce Seema Malhotra, uh, who is MP for Feltham and Heston um, and on the shadow front bench as a shadow business minister. So over to you, Seema. Thank Thanks for joining us. Thank you so much, Alex. Can you hear me? Uh, is that yeah. okay? Can, we, can you hear me? Yes, yep, we can hear yeah. you. Is that better? That is better. Great. I've no idea where the mic is on my computer, but I, I have to lean in. Um, look, uh, firstly, I, I would just say a few words and um, then keep sort of listen and support uh, the, in, through the questions and answers as well. Uh, just it's such a pleasure to be here um, with all of you and to follow. Um, I just heard Catherine speaking a little bit there. Um, I, I think you've probably covered a fair bit of what the EU had done for women. And I think we sort of covered that quite a lot before in terms of whether that's in sort of um, uh, employment rights or, um, or otherwise and support for families with um, food standards um, and, and, and so much more. And just to sort of give a perspective on where I think we may need to be going now, there's um, a sort of reality check that I think we need to, um, to have in terms of recognising that um, uh, on the one hand, Brexit has happened. On the other hand, we can see issue after issue starting to emerge where the transition out of the EU is not the smooth sailing that the government is trying to pretend that it is. There are very practical and very real issues for, um, for businesses, for uh, our exporters. Uh, we've seen a drop off in trade um, as well with the EU. We've seen difficulty getting in supplies from the EU. That's affecting costs. Um, uh, whether that's in construction or elsewhere. Um, and in the end, all of those costs are landing on, will be landing on consumers. We've also seen um, greater difficulty in terms of being able to travel, um, families being affected. Um, I have uh, one constituent who has fallen between the stools on a passport and the end date of her passport and whether the nine months on there is really more than six months, or whether the fact that she had a grace few months um, is, uh, doesn't count, you know, it doesn't really count. So she had to cancel a holiday at the weekend with two days notice because of the interpretation about whether there was more than six months left on her passport. Now, these are practical things that are gonna start to weave through. And when I think about um, you know, um, you know, we can talk specifically about women, but I think there's also an issue now is um, women um, uh, in work um, and opportunities being lost, women in business, women who are often sort of the main people involved in their families in helping with um, uh, support for, you know, helping with their, their um, families going abroad, etc., keeping families together. Um, and I, so I think that the difficulties that sort of difficulties that families are going to be facing um, whether it's on access to services, whether it's on things like telecoms and whether there's going to be roaming charges, whether there's um, uh, issues to do with um, with travel or with even caring responsibilities for families. There's, there's so much more that is going to come our way. Um, I think then we've got a real question about how we're going to, as a, um, as a party, sort of look at some of these um, issues. And... Um, and some of those that have begun to be on um, on my radar um, uh, as well um, uh, this around sort of our you know business and our constitution um, are going to continue to be issues. But we are going to have to think um, uh, beyond that. We're going to have to think differently now um, about consumer protection. As I mentioned, I think we're going to have to be thinking differently now um, about you know implications sometimes for welfare and, uh, and social care. I think we're going to have to be thinking, um, you know, post-COVID and implications for um, uh, for, for uh, our workforce and industries. Where I'm hearing again and again that um, uh, people cannot get um, staff for um, for their sectors. That I think there's labour market impacts 
um, that Brexit has had that has not been dealt with strategically by this government that is starting to affect um, how um, how businesses, and I'm talking about, you know, as one example, hospitality uh, and a lot of women-led businesses as well, where I've been talking to women over the last two weeks. Um, it's being it's incredibly difficult to carry on what you were doing before, even within the context um, of, um, of, of having got some support from the government during COVID. A lot has not reached. Um, and I'm also particularly worried now about... Um, those who have been citizens of, you know, citizens of EU countries who are um, in the UK, how many may miss the deadline next week, what that's going to mean for um, families, what that's going to mean for children in our schools. Um, I mean, there is a kind of a, a perfect storm awaiting us over the next um, few months um, as these some of these issues start to um, uh, start to emerge. Um, so I think that you know, just 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 adding some of that in there that may may or may not have been added. I think from the front from a front bench point of view, starting to think uh, a bit more what the future is going to be, how Labour's going to need to respond, and just how we need to work with our European partners um, is going to be a critical part of this. But there are ways in which we're already starting to build new networks with um, EU parliamentarians, recognising that um, you know for the for the large part. They want to also keep good relationships with us, that we've got a government that seems to want to stand in the way of that with the way it, I, I think it sort of treats dialogue and seems to disrespect agreements um, that it has, um, you know, that it has put its name to and put our country's name to. And I think it is going to be so important over the next period that through the Labour Party, we're able to continue to grow and maintain our relationship with our EU partners. I think that's going to be critical to do that on a, maybe a policy and some policy but also on issues um, where we're going to uh, uh, solidarity internationally on how we respond. I say that because for example this is not an international government but if we look for example at the issue of um, uh, Palestine and Israel um, and the commonality in seeking a two-state solution but international justice as well and upholding of international law that we can't do that as a nation on our own we need dialogue and we need solidarity and it's one space in which actually maintaining relationships with um, parliamentarians and parliaments across Europe is starting to have greater traction than what our government is doing itself I think that's going to continue to be essential for us for our security for our industry um, and for our and and for um, thinking about how we're going to make the transition con that continues out of the EU as easy as possible, with the least uh, ongoing impacts as possible, um, so that we can actually have um, a strong relationship that continues uh, with Parliament's bilaterally, but with the institution as a whole as well. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Seema, for that. And it is so important that we uh, continue to build good relationships with parliamentarians uh, within the EU Parliament and across other parliaments um, in Europe. So we're now going to go uh, back to the questions. I'm going to ask uh, Kudzia um, to speak next. And we're answering questions about uh, the Erasmus scheme, uh, working with the cooperative movement and who speaks for women um, within uh, the Labour Party. Thanks, um, Alex. And Seema, that was really heartening to hear and heartening to hear that, you know, it's not that we have to keep fighting that fight under the radar, around the radar, by the radar in all the ways that we can. Um, just wanted to go to back to Monica's question about who, who there is. And I think it's really important to highlight that we have, um, as a country, an equalities minister that has no interest inequalities, an equalities minister that doesn't prioritise women, doesn't prioritise people who are um, um, who have protected characteristics as defined by the Equalities Act. And I think, you know, it's our job uh, as a trade union movement, certainly, but, you know, as a wider society to hold people that fall short to account. And I think, you know, we've got a government with a majority that is behaving in a way uh, particularly towards women, particularly towards um, black and minority ethnic people, particularly towards disabled people, particularly towards LGBT plus people that I'm trying to find a charitable way to describe it. The only way I can think of is with contempt. 
And I think, you know, it's not about us finding that one figurehead. It's about really utilizing figureheads in in the um, in the opposition, in the labor movement, in business to really stand together against these attacks. Sorry, I forgot to unmute. Um, thanks, Kunzia. Um, and over to Glenis now, please. Thanks very much. Um, there's a number of questions there, and there's been some that's been coming up that I've, I've seen. Uh, I think in terms of representing women, I still don't feel that our voice is heard sufficiently, even in the Labour Party. Uh, I, I, and certainly not in government. There was a minister on, on the politics show yesterday, I can't remember who it was now, I just briefly glanced at it. And uh, she, they were talking about why didn't the Tory party have all women shortlists and take a lead from Labour in order to get more women in, in Parliament? Because unless we have more women in Parliament, uh, you know, our, our uh, representatives don't understand many of the issues that affect women, unfortunately. And people need to see women there and women need to be there to understand the issues. And unless they, they, they are, we're not going to get anywhere. And she just said, I mean, a woman minister said to the um, to the uh, interviewer that uh, she didn't believe in in uh, putting women onto all women shortlist because this was a meritocracy and women should get there on their own merits. Why should a woman be put in front of a good man? How many times do we have to go through this blooming argument? How many times? It's ridiculous. They know that women are disadvantaged at those sort of uh, at that sort of level you know, at all, all levels in, in political life. And not to take positive action to me is criminal. It's not just for women, it's for a lot of different uh, sectors of society. But we were particularly talking about women. I thought it was disgraceful. Somebody has put something about, uh, uh, I mean, I think on the Erasmus thing, I think it's horrendous what's happening with Erasmus. So many young people have benefited I think the problem is mostly middle class uh, children and I think what we should have had was an Erasmus scheme that encouraged people from poorer backgrounds to participate. That would have been what we really could do with. But somebody's put up there about inequality and what was the EU doing about inequality across Europe and about UK austerity. Well, you know, when I, I actually come, my dad was a miner, I come from mining areas and when all the, the mines were closed, the, the only thing that helped was EU structural funds. And we had lots of money coming from EU structural funds. It hasn't done the job as much as we would want it to, but that was down to the way the structural funds were spent. So, you know, the EU does look at how it can help in terms of equality. Uh, I mean, it's something really that our national government should be taking more seriously. When it comes to the EU, uh, wanting to spend more money, our, it was always our government, not the Labour government, I mean the UK government, that always railed against it. Now you can't do things about inequalities in different countries and different areas of the same country unless you're prepared to spend the money. And our government was one of the worst at not wanting to spend the money. And that wasn't just under Tory, that was at Labour governments and Tory governments, but of course the Tories were much, much worse. So I think the EU did try very hard to deal with many inequalities, uh, but you know, it, it's all a matter of what member states will allow them to do. The EU in itself doesn't just make these decisions. These decisions have to be agreed by the member states as well. And people seem to forget that. So many times on the doorstep, I used to hear, I'm fed up of Brussels making all of our laws. And I used to say to them, did you know that our ministers have to agree to those laws before they become EU law? And people just didn't understand the mechanism of EU legislation and that the EU Parliament voted something through, but all of the member states had to agree as well and had to come to a compromise. And they just didn't understand that and still don't, I'm afraid. Thanks, Glenys. And that's one thing we'll have to get everyone to understand if we ever have another referendum in the future. Right. Sorry, so our next, Tom. <laughs> our next round of questions, uh, please. I'm going to take Anne Black, then uh, Nicola Maul and then Brenda Ashton. So I will ask you to unmute. And if you could unmute yourselves, please. 
So first of all, Anne, please. Um, okay, well, it's really good to see Glenys again because among her many other achievements, she chaired the NEC from the back end of 2016 through one of the most difficult years that the NEC has had until the latest one. Um, following up some of Seema's points, I think it's important that Labour starts holding the Tories to account on the way they're implementing Brexit, rather than treating it as something that we cannot mention, because we're just accused of being moaning Ramonas who just want to rejoin. Even if we are, and we do, we have to um, stop being silent on it. And the final point is that um, even Remainers think that the vaccine programme has been so successful in the UK uh, relative to um, the rest of Europe because we are no longer in the European Union. Uh, and that's something that, according to polls, even uh, Remain voters believe about the one good thing about Brexit, if they can think of any. So is that true? Uh, and if it isn't, what do we say about it? Again, without wanting the vaccine programme to fail. So thanks. Very interesting question. Right, uh, Nicola, please. Yep. So um, my question specifically is, um, you know, in, in a country where the Home Office is becoming very hostile towards um, EU citizens, whether they have pre-settled status or settled status, how um, do we go about, you know, protecting um, the rights of our EU sisters, particularly um, when it seems like no one actually seems to really care about those, um, especially in, in the government right now? Great. Um, and Brenda, please. Hi, yes, uh, following on from that, actually, I am more than perturbed about the fact that we have, what, just over a week to go till um, the EU SS uh, is apparently closed with the, the you know, with, with the rider that is going to be um, um, lengthened. But what's going to happen after that? And um, EU citizens... Uh, it's not straightforward, and our friends in Three Million and um, in Limbo will will know about this much better. But um, money is involved. Children, EU citizen children, have not got identity documents. We're involved, Liverpool for Europe, with helping with financial funds for those children, and they just don't have the money to go and get ID cards, passports, to travel to wherever they have. These things are not being spoken about. And the other, the other part of my um, comment really is to, as a plea to LME members to speak up in their branches and CLPs for EU citizens, and particularly for ch uh, children in care and the disenfranchised, disadvantaged, uh, disadvantaged sectors of, uh, of, of our friends, families, acquaintances, because branch and CLP members just don't know about it. You know, if we don't talk up, speak up for them, they don't regard them as part of the community and they don't understand the huge issues that are involved in, in what's happening now. Thanks, Brenda. And I think that's a good opportunity for me to plug the Labour Movement for Europe. Uh, we're the yes. only pro-EU society affiliated to the Labour Party. Um, I know that many of you are members um, already, in which case, um, please encourage others to join. Um, if you're not a member, um, I'm sure we can get up in the chat um, exactly the best way to join so you can come to more events like this um, and make sure that we keep um, our party pro-European and internationalist. So, uh, answering those questions now on vaccines um, and EU citizens' rights, um, I'll turn first to Seema, please. Maybe I won't. <laughs> In which case, uh, Kutsia, do you want to kick off on that one? Yeah, there's nothing that rattles my cage more than the Tories taking the credit for the vaccine programme that the NHS so diligently and so successfully and against insane pressures and cost cutting rolled out and rolled out on the back of volunteers, on the back of working around the clock, on the back of women delivering the programme. And uh, by the way, being denied the well and those working in the healthcare services being often really offensive pay cuts, um, 
real time pay cuts, but pay rises in, in recognition of that service. The reality is we were always in control, whether inside of Europe or outside of Europe, of our vaccination approval program. And, you know, and that's another one of those myths that um, goes around and around the system. The fact that, you know, we are out of Europe, therefore we were able to fast track this um, vaccine is a nonsense. What it has shown is, though, um, how the breakdown in our relationship with Europe has impacted our our um, the vaccine rollout more broadly and which if anybody understands pandemics knows that us vaccinating ourselves doesn't really matter if we can't make sure the rest of the world gets vaccinated as well so I you know I I reject that notion that Brexit aided the vaccination I reject even harder that the Tories had anything to do with it sorry it makes me so cross <laughs> Thank you. Uh, we, we feel your crossness. <laughs> right. Uh, Glenys, next, please. Yeah, I mean, that's uh, it, I shout at the I shout at the TV when the news is on. I do. It's it's ridiculous. I shout at it when people start saying that we wouldn't have had this vaccine rollout had we been in the EU. It's absolute nonsense. We could have done whatever we wanted, whether we were inside the EU or or not, you don't have to uh, agree to, to have the same scheme as even if you're within the EU. So that's absolute nonsense. And it really winds me up when people, you know, people, friends of mine who are pro-EU will say to me, yes, but you can't deny we've had such a good rollout of the vaccine and we wouldn't have had that in the EU. It is so, so frustrating. Um, I want to just talk very quickly, uh, go back on Erasmus, because I've seen that, uh, Je Jennifer is saying there's a webinar uh, about Erasmus and she's making the point quite rightly that it's not just open to university students. I know it isn't just open to university students, Jennifer, but how many people from work, how many pe kids from working class backgrounds actually go and, and use it, used to use the Erasmus scheme? How many? And that's the point. And we need funding to make sure that they're encouraged to do it. And, you know, there's, you've also put that middle class families can't afford to send their kids away for a year. Well, no, nobody can. But I would just like to see uh, a, a bit more recognition that, you know, we should be offering this chance to as many kids as possible from all backgrounds, whoever they are. That's the only point I was making. On the EU citizens, we can't leave EU citizens in limbo. But I tell you something that I, I found regularly the number of people I know who have second homes in Spain or France or where, wherever who voted to leave the EU and are now whinging to me that they can't go there whenever they want because they can only stay there for six months uh, for three months out of uh, every six or whatever it is and they're complaining like mad and 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 saying to me well we didn't know this was going to happen well actually nobody told us they said we did tell them we did tell them we told them time and time and time again but all they were quoting was this is project fear this is project fear well now it's come to pass they understand what we were saying is true and hopefully more and more people will realize that what we were saying is is actually that was actually fact and not fiction and that's why i hope people will start to change the to change their mind and the tide will turn towards the EU. But for EU citizens living in the UK, we should be doing everything we can. I know the deadline's nearly up in order to apply for settled status here. And uh, we need to make sure that anybody who wants settled status, that deadline should be extended and anybody who wants settled status should actually be able to get it, anybody. Thanks, Glenys. Uh, Catherine now, please. Thank you, Chair. And um, after this, I'm going to have to go because it is quite a busy day in Parliament. But I will be on the call at 5.30 for the phone canvassing for Kim, um, the wonderful Kim. Um, just briefly on the looked after children, uh, the Local Government Association Labour Group has been really proactive on this. And actually, Labour councils have been quite forensic going through their caseloads and making sure that um, under 18s or even under 21 year olds have got their documentation. And the good thing about that is that the council can pay for it. So in some ways, if it's a labour area and they're efficient, those children might be in a better position than, say, 
in a family where a parent might not speak English very well and may not know what their rights are. So we have to have an all-encompassing approach to young people because we don't want another repeat of the Windrush situation. Um, colleagues might be aware that in London, um, our Mayor of London, Sadiq Khan, has set up an EU hub. And um, I'd be very happy to put round and circulate the details of that because what is going to happen is in four or five months' time, you will be approached as somebody who knows something about Europe. Um, and the hub has got lawyers, it's got access to experts. Um, and also my own office is doing a lot of troubleshooting for people who are sort of moving around a lot. So they may not have necessarily, you know, a, a permanent address, or they have a really unhelpful Tory MP who won't lift a finger. Um, you'd be surprised how many MPs do not answer their emails. <laughs> Um, and so I'm very, very happy to take charge of that. So if you hear of people, please let me know. That was really the theme of my tweet um, of the five years since the election. It was really to say, you know, we're in this situation, as everybody on this call has said, we have to pick up every single detail of the Brexit negotiation and how it's all going pear shaped. But in terms of the human cost of this, it can't be the children of EU nationals who suffer. Um, and you know, I, I know very intimately um, two EU students who share a flat with my daughter in first year university and they haven't got the first clue about their rights. Um, and these are university kids. Imagine what it's like if you're working in a rural area, um, working in a particular very isolated kind of workplace. And that's where also we have to join together with our trade union colleagues to make sure that there's nobody in any of our regions who misses out on that crucial advice. So if in doubt, contact my office or the EU hub, which is a London funded thing, but which is actually really good, it has experts, um, because we have to bring into a proper status every single EU national who we're worried about and make sure that they know what their rights are. Um, for those of you who will be on the call at 5.30 to do phone banking for Kim, I will see you then. Um, and could I thank you, Chair, and all of our um, uh, panellists and just say to Glenis, Glenis, you would remember Mary Turner. And when I was a council leader, she said to me, Catherine, we didn't know where to start on workers' rights. So I started with getting proper rubber gloves for the women so that when they were serving dinners, that was what we worked on. And she and I worked very hard on paying the London living wage to school meal um, staff. And we have to start somewhere with this. So, you know, let's stick together. Let's start where we are in our workplaces. Let's start where we are in terms of reaching out to any um, EU nationals who we know. And let's start with keeping together as a group as pro-Europeans so that we don't lose the faith, because I think that's a very important thing to remember who are the women who have inspired us. Thank you so much, Catherine. I can see lots of virtual applause happening for you. <laughs> I've got one final question that I'm gonna take from Amanda. Amanda, would you like to uh, unmute yourself, please? Hi, yes, sorry about that. Uh, caught me on the hop there. Um, so I just had a, a question. I'm part of a group of uh, survivors of sexual violence setting up. Uh, we're working with the rape crisis centres across London to try to set up a kind of pan-London lobbying group politically to try to get some change around domestic abuse and sexual violence. And I just wondered, are there... or I almost feel I ought to say were there, but I'm going to say, are there any sp uh, specific protections which are enshrined in EU regulations or, or law protecting women and girls from sexual violence or domestic abuse, which have been undermined by the process of exiting the EU, i.e. the dreaded Brexit? And, and if there are, um, how would any of the panellists or other people present suggest that we could work with our European partners to try to make good the deficit going forward? Thanks very much. Thanks, Amanda. Um, so I'll take Glenys and then uh, Kudzia and then we'll draw to a close. So if you'd like to address that and, and any more concluding remarks um, that you'd like to make as well. So over to you, Glenys. Thanks very much. Uh, I, I'm not sure there is, as far as I'm aware, but I've been retired since 2018, so maybe something's happened since then, but um, I, not as far as I'm aware, there ought to be 
I mean, it sounds like a very good idea, but I would think it would be up to member states at this moment uh, to deal with. Um, I mean, it's such a, you know, it has such a terrible effect on people. Sexual violence is something uh, that we're not taking that seriously at this moment as a country. Look at what's happening with the rape cases and the amount of people that are just not being prosecuted for rape. You know, it's just, it's as if, well, I, it comes back to my issue about having more women in, in, in positions of power and, and in Parliament. I think if there were more women, maybe something more would be done about it. This government keeps saying it's uh, it's committed to doing something about it, but it doesn't seem very committed to me uh, to do something about uh, prosecuting acts of sexual violence. So, you know, my answer to you honestly is, I don't know if there's anything uh, the EU is doing about it, but as far as I was aware when I was there, there wasn't, uh, but there should be. Um, remarks. Uh, first of all, I just want to say hi to Anne Black. I can't see her anymore, but I haven't seen you for ages. There you are. Lovely to see you again, Anne. Uh, it's great to have these sorts of discussions with women across the country. I always used to love the uh, women's conferences because I always felt so comfortable and at home at women's conferences and so many women who wouldn't get up and speak at a normal conference at the national conference would get up and and say their piece at women's conference. So I always thought it was a, a, a really wonderful occasion to meet up with other women and have women express their opinions and feel safe and secure to do so. We shouldn't have to feel like that, but unfortunately many women do. So it is great to see you all. And we've got a few men in with us as well. So hello to them. And there's been some good cont contributions from one or two of the men as well. Um, I just think it's been a really good discussion today. I think we understand how much European legislation has, has pushed forward the, the, the rights for women and, and made women's life so much better, but there is so much more to do, so much more to achieve. And we really must keep those contacts going, keep that campaigning going. And, uh, you know, I mentioned Anne Black, there's one person who does loads of things for women on the national executive, and that's somewhere else. We forget about our national executive, and we forget about the fact that we should be pushing these, this agenda uh, on our national executive as well, and Anne does that on our behalf. Uh, so it's not just uh, across Europe, it's within our own party. We've got to start the campaigning. We've got to make sure that when it comes to our next manifesto, that women are up there top and center. And we make sure that all the issues affecting women, whether it be issues about the workplace, equality and sexual violence are at the top of our agenda as a party. We've got to do that. We really must. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thanks ever so much, Glenys. Uh, could see her, please. Thank you. Um, with regards to the um, com the um, question about sexual violence and rape and the survivors of sexual abuse, I know that it was only after um, um, the EU revised their directive on um, equal treatment between men and women in 2006 did we um, amend our Sex Discrimination Act. And the Sex Discrimination Act really you know, has a line in there around um, behavior that violates the dignity or creates humi humiliating or offensive working environments for women. So from a workforce perspective, you know, it was the EU that said, this is not acceptable behavior because we've all got anecdotal stories of that kind of behavior that takes place um, that women are subject to and have been subject to. And, you know, and I want to be really clear about the line between accepting that kind of behavior and, um, really awful acts of sexual violence that people experience. So I think the EU were really clear in telling our government that absolutely under no circumstances was this okay and, and it became our law. And another thing that happened as an outcome of that was they um, we had to shift the burden of proof. So the burden of proof in discrimination cases was no longer on women. And I think that's a really important aspect about believing the victims, about believing those that say that they have been subject to this behavior. 
So I think that is really important. And the other end of the spectrum is, you know, I said it before and I'll say it again, we've got a government that has no interest in equalities. It's got no interest in uh, the issues that affect women and the issues that um, impact women. Um, I talked earlier about the cuts to funding services that women need to access during the pandemic, about the increase in violence towards women, domestic violence, sexual harassment cases, you know, things that you think, well, how can they increase during the pandemic? We're all at home, you know, and the reality of what women's home life and what women are exposed to, and especially, especially women that are marginalised, migrant women um, and women that... Um, are um, in poverty. Um, we um, joined with um, a whole bunch of organisations following the really tragic death of Sarah Everard to demand better from the government and to call on ministers to, you know, um, really implement mandatory duties to end sexual harassment, to end violence against women, for gender-based violence to be recognised as a hate crime. And, and one of the more important aspects, to reverse the cuts to public services to ensure that all relevant public sector staff receive enhanced training on preventing and responding to violence against women. You know, we've got, we've got to um, deal with it when it rises, but we've also got the, a duty to really work towards a preventative culture and those things need to happen together. And to provide long-term funding commitments to support the provision of vi vital life-saving services for survivors of domestic abuse and sexual violence um, that meet the level of need. Um, and that includes, you know, BME women, um, LGBT plus women, disabled women, um, because we think unless we can solve it for everybody, it's going to remain a problem. And we must keep demanding that the government doesn't forget women, doesn't forget the violence that women face and really changes those things that happen. I mean, we could we could have another deep rooted conversation about, you know, dis dismantling misogyny and patriarchy. Um, and but I think Glennis really articulated that well when she said we need representation of women and we need women at every single level you know there are more women in the workforce than there are men yet when you look at leadership structures it's not reflected when you look at my own movement you know we are dealing with sexual harassment we're dealing with the lack of women representation in leadership roles having said that you know i work for one of the strongest women in leadership in in any country and um, who is an unbelievable unequivocal advocate for women's rights and for the important issues that matter to women and does not hold back on speaking truth to power when needed but what i would say and, and and you could you know if you've ever heard me speak before if you ever hear me speak again i will always say it we're strongest when we're together we need to organize we need to be active and we need to make change you know we cannot rest on anybody especially men sorry men to make that change for us it's up to us to do it ourselves and also we've got to teach the men that we're responsible for um children to be um anti-patriarchal anti-misogynistic and feminists thank you so much um, and for ending on that that call to arms um so uh thank uh, i mean that was a really great uh discussion everybody a uh, good comradely discussion lots of uh you know information that we've all got you know we did trade we did tory nonsense on vaccines we even did toothpaste for a little while um amanda do have a look at um, the istanbul convention labor meps were really good at leading the way on that and the tory government completely dragging their heels um, on ratifying um, that agreement so a big thank you um, to all of our speakers, to Catherine West, uh, to Glenis Wilmot, to Seema Malhotra, to Kudsia Batul. Uh, do join a trade union, do join the Labour Movement for Europe, all the information is in the chat, and do uh, come back and join us this evening at half past five for telephoning to make sure we get another Labour woman elected. So thanks everyone so much for coming, have a good rest of the day and keep safe everyone. Thank you.